questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Good evening. Hopefully tonight you will have some questions to ask Dr. Grady McMurtry, who's just outside Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States of America, and we welcome him to the programs. Uh, speaking from a hotel room or some where? Yes. Less yes, from hotel room, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we apologize for the, uh, the lack of uh, internet connection, which might be uh, the norm for Dr. Grady to be with us, um, and a little bit lacking tonight, but nevertheless, let it not be uh, a miss for you to take this opportunity to uh, question Dr. Grady with uh, his particular uh, stance on creation uh, rather than that we evolved. Uh, tonight uh, is an opportunity, it is live, it's 4th of February and it is Monday evening as he looks at his notes just in case he didn't know. Every day is the same for me because hopefully when we serve the Lord uh, every day should be, um, you know, we should take advantage of the the opportunity we have to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Dr. Grady, yes, what, sir. Uh, where are you on, where you, what, what are you up to? Well, I'm speaking at a church right now, as well as a Christian academy associated with the church. And I'll be there through Wednesday night. And then on Thursday, I'm going to be doing a couple of sessions for a local Bible college in Atlanta. Now, you were saying that uh, the, the, the actual temperature there, which is normally very humid and hot uh, in the summer, is a little, a little bit cooler tonight, even at Atlanta. Well, yes, it's uh, went down to freezing last night, but it's uh, 40s to 60s Fahrenheit, and that's really quite normal for this time of year in Atlanta. Yeah, well, it will suit you, because I know you don't like hot temperatures, even though you live in Florida. But That's uh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, Anything new since we last spoke? I always ask the same question, but I just know that you're probably more in touch with what's going on in the, uh, the world of science and uh, uh, the sort of advances that w have to be made in order to prove that, you know, we are created, a created uh, being rather than something that's evolved. Well, of course, there's continuous daily research that's being published. Uh, one of the things that I like to always point out is that, for instance, the most recent DNA research has proven that people, Neanderthals, were in fact the same. That uh, Neanderthals are 100% human. Same thing with Cro-Magnons and so forth. Uh, that there's no truth to human evolution. And I always like to keep that in everybody's mind. That is such a difficult project um, or ministry uh, to to overcome the sort of uh, objections that people have. Uh, and even within the church, we, we're dealing with uh, things even in the United Kingdom right now where the government is split at the moment, the Conservative Party, I don't know whether you've heard, but you know, gay marriage uh, be becoming something which is acceptable, even being able to be performed in the church, that the church at this moment in time uh, are not uh, legally bound to perform the gay marriage, but uh, how far away is that uh, from being uh, forced upon well, us? And yet the, the Conservative Party itself is, is in disarray uh, and uh, the backbenchers or whatever you want to call them are saying, look, we don't, we've had enough of this. We don't want it thrust upon us. Well, the fact of the matter is we're dealing with morality there. And, of course, what has happened in the UK, just as much as it has happened in the United States and in other countries that were predominantly Christian at one time, is that as we move away from God's laws, God's natural law revealed to us in the Bible, uh, which was the, the backbone of Blackstone's law in the United Kingdom uh, back 200, 250 years ago, uh, and the same here, because, of course, it was brought here from England, um, as we move away from the Bible, as we move away from Blackstone and English common law, which was founded in the Bible, uh, people becoming more and more liberal. Now, this is because in our public school systems, our government-run systems, they have continued to teach evolution only. And evolution has no moral basis. Evolution says you're nothing but a thinking animal. When that is true, then there's nothing wrong with gay marriage. Hmm. Uh, well, there's also the appointment of the new um, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, that's going to be a challenging year for him uh, because he's dealing with not only this particular topic, but also uh, the introduction of acceptance for uh, women bishops in the church. Well, and of course that has already happened in the United States. What we call ECUSA, Episcopal Church USA, 
um, which is the the American branch of the Anglican Church in in the UK. Uh, we already have uh, a female presiding bishop. We already have an openly gay male uh, bishop of a state. Um, so really, it's worse here in one sense of the word. But when you have an archbishops of Canterbury who have in the past, I, I don't know about the current newest one, but but in the past have condoned uh, openly uh, gay homosexual lifestyles, um, have considered the Bible to to not be an errant. The Bible is just um, you know a book to to some of them in the past, um, and have even condoned uh, translations of the Bible which were openly homosexual. Um, you know, you, you, I find it uh, just absolutely abhorrent what has gone on in the Anglican Church. Just qualify what you said. What you said there—that the the translation of the Bible openly homosexual. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yes, uh, there was a translation that was endorsed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and and please, um, my my date may be wrong. Okay. But I was actually in England and actually uh, reading the newspaper the, the week that it was made news. Um, it was in June, and I would say approximately six to eight years ago. Wouldn't be Lord Carey? Uh, I don't recall. I just okay. know it was the Archbishop. I, I couldn't think it would be, but... Um... Uh, but uh, there was a translation that was done by an apostate Baptist pastor who was then condoned um, by the Archbishop of Canterbury in which um, they went to gender neutral, uh, used uh, nicknames for the apostles so that Peter was then named Rocky, I think it was. Uh, it was an absolutely atrocious uh, piece of work. Uh, and yet the Archbishop had condoned it. Well, um, maybe somebody who's watching tonight will be able to put their finger on that. Yeah, and, uh, I, I, was, I was very busy at the time with other things. I was speaking at a conference in Brighton at the time, and so I only read very quickly through this. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I was also trying to challenge Richard Dawkins, so you know, I had a lot of things on my plate. We just followed uh, a live Bible study, so I'm not quite sure whether this uh, first question that's come in uh, was due to that particular uh, project or uh, topic in the uh, Bible study uh, preceding this live programming is, uh, of Q&A. But let me read it out anyway, because Dr. Grady deals with other uh, issues uh, with, within the, the Bible, so it's not just on creation. So he's a, a well-learned man. Uh, if you want to put other biblical um, topics or questions or, to him. This uh, comes in as a text, so it's very short. Uh, what made Paul think that Christ's return was imminent in his day? I'm not so sure that Paul actually felt that it was imminent, um, simply because, of course, he would go on to try to calm down the fears of those who thought it was. You know, he says, don't worry about those who've already passed away. Uh, they also will rise first, you know, so he was reassuring them uh, about this. After all, there was widespread uh, thought at the time, 2,000 years ago, that Jesus was returning very quickly, that, that indeed uh, when Christians started dying and he hadn't come back, uh, this is when Paul starts to reassure them that they're not to worry about that. And so... Uh, um, the, the thought that, that when Jesus said, you know, I'm going to, to, to heaven, I'm going to be with the Father, I'm going back and so forth, many thought that that quite literally was in their generation. Obviously, it's been 2,000 years, he has not come back yet, and that is the blessed hope of all Christians. But really, Paul was the one who was the most effective in reassuring everybody, don't worry, this is, this is okay, there's nothing wrong here. Uh, and so I would say that he, he wasn't uh, really thinking that the Lord would come back immediately. Hmm. Where do you think they got that thinking from, that idea that the Lord's return was imminent? Well, you know, there, there's uh, certainly um, Jesus' expression, you know, wait, actively wait, actively occupy till I return. It seemed like, I'm sure to many of them, uh, an immediate thing that, um, 
he said, you know, I'm, I'm going, and, and when you think about it, I mean, he did go to heaven, receive a glorified body, did come back, did, did walk with him for 40 days um, until his ascension. Um, you can think why many people would have thought that it was a, a, a very soon coming thing. Um, what I think many Christians have had to come to grips with is that this is not necessarily what, what he had in mind. Mm. And obviously we've had 2,000 years of history since then. Mm. Obviously it's always easier to look back with hindsight, but I, you know, it seems to me that when we do look back, uh, we'll see the error, if you like, of our ways, uh, particularly with uh, chronology uh, and the timing of Christ's return. But Jesus yeah. did say other things that would show that uh, time, you know, there would be time uh, for the Gentiles to, to fully be um, if you, an opportunity for them to be reconciled to God. That fullness of the Gentiles has not run out yet. Well, that's just it. You know, when you think about it, Jesus said in his great commandment that we're going to go to, to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth should tell you that it wasn't going to be immediate. Yes, even 40 or 50 years. Exactly. I mean, it would have not have been possible for them to have even reached the ends of the earth with the message, reached all the people groups, etc., in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, John writes in, John is uh, one who writes in quite regularly and it's usually on the same sort of topic, uh, but I'm, I'm going to read it anyway. Um, most of the traditional uh, Christianity, I suppose, or churches say that the truth regarding the Godhead is that it's a trinity composed of three in one, the Son, the Father and the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, Jesus Christ says otherwise, clearly stating two in one in John 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one, not two-thirds of one. Who is correct? The fake Christian churches of God who cannot lie. Uh, this is from John. Well, John, uh, actually, I don't like the use of the word Trinity because, as you have defined it, it's an incorrect usage. Uh, God is a triune God. He is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, simply because Jesus said the Father and I are one does not negate the fact that the Holy Spirit is equal. And you'll find the reference, I think, best in John chapter 14, in verses 16 and 17, where Jesus says, I'm going to pray to the Father, he's going to send you another. The word meaning equal, but different. And the other is the Spirit, the Comforter, Counselor, uh, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit of God. But the triune nature of God is also revealed to us in other scriptures. For instance, uh, three times in Isaiah, uh, probably Isaiah 61, starting with verse 1, would be the most common one people would go to. And Jesus even read from that in Luke 4 uh, in his home synagogue. And so uh, Jews and Christians understand that we have one God. The great Shema of Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. But he has revealed to us in the three personalities of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Jews clearly understood God was a triune God. And as I say, there's at least three references just in Isaiah to this. Hmm. Good answer. Um, hopefully that will satisfy John, but I doubt it. But John, God bless you. Thanks for uh, always being part of the program. Let me go to the next one. Darren says, how did Adam and Eve know uh, what death was if it did not exist? This is a good question because it, uh, something I used to think about, you know, when Adam was said, uh, what well, God said to Adam was in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. There's a tree of knowledge of good and bad. Um, there was not much of a deterrent in that if Adam didn't know what death was. I can understand the concept, certainly. But Adam did have a complete whole language. He was able to walk and talk with God. And if God uses the word death, then, then Adam had to have that word in his vocabulary, or he, or he couldn't have had the conversation. Now, in addition to that, remember that when God said, do not eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, dying, thou shalt die, speaking of two deaths. There's the physical death and the spiritual death that if you eat this fruit, you're going to die spiritually now, and that is going to eventually lead to your physical death later. Which was 930 years later or whatever. Indeed. So uh, I agree, they had never witnessed death, 
but there are words that I know that I have never personally seen and yet understand their meaning. So uh, I, I don't see that that's a problem, except that we'll agree they had never seen death before, uh, probably didn't understand it in its totality. But indeed, the way it is used is, of course, death being a separation from God, the spiritual separation from God, and the physical death being the only way in which we can then be reunited with him again in the future. Okay. Uh, just to remind our viewers that this is live, uh, live at revelationtv.com, and also the uh, telephone number for sending your text in should come up on your screen just as I speak. Thank you very much, guys. Um, this is uh, Monday, and it is the 4th of February. Next uh, question uh, that comes in. Hi, guys. Does Dr. Grady believe in a Yeti or a Bigfoot? Or is it foolish nonsense, says Steve from Cumbria? Oh, foolish, foolish nonsense is what I would suggest. Um, but remember, that these are mythology. This is all it is. But mythology always starts in reality somewhere. Uh, somebody in the Himalayas uh, sees a real person as a shadow in a snowstorm, and suddenly this becomes a monster. Uh, the same thing is true if somebody sees something moving in the woods in the American Northwest, um, which is not any kind of strange creature or Bigfoot or whatever, but it yields the mythology of it nonetheless. It may have just been a shadow. But myth always starts in reality, but these are definitely mythological creatures. What would you say to somebody who would say, ah, yes, Jesus Christ is really just mythology? Well, that's not possible because Jesus Christ's historicity is well established. Um, any legitimate historian would agree that a man named Jesus Christ lived, not only has he mentioned in the Bible, of course, but he's also mentioned in the works of historians such as Flavius Josephus. Um, we have the testimony of over 500 people seeing him after his resurrection. This is not mythology. This is history. And so even though you may not agree with who he was, the Son of God, uh, the Savior of the world, the, the Lamb of God slain since before the foundation of the world. The fact that he lived is not debatable. What is the premier number one argument that uh, every Christian should know to argue creation versus evolution, says uh, um, Brian in Stoke? Well, of course there are many, but the easiest for most Christians is the one that Paul used in Romans chapter 1, the argument by design. The human mind intrinsically knows the difference between randomness and design, and you don't have to be a scientist to understand that. Now, of course, there are lots of other things. Entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, proves that evolution is not true, that creation is true. Uh, trality of amino acids in human bodies proves that evolution is not true, that creation is true. I mean, you know, we can get to the technical stuff. But, but simply that when you see design, there's a designer. Uh, you know, again, if you see a chair, you know there's a chair maker. A piano, there's a piano maker. You see a plane, you know there's an airplane maker. Uh, and yet, as Paul says, the, the people who actually made the plane or the chair or the piano is invisible to us. Paul says the invisible God is made known to us through the things that he has made. And so this argument by design is a very powerful argument. Mm. Because no one can deny that when you see a piano, there's a piano maker. But have you ever seen the piano maker? No, they're invisible to me. Uh, depending upon the age of the piano, they've already passed on. If they're Christians, I may see them in the future, uh, but I might never see them in this lifetime. Hmm. Bluthners, Becksteins. A big pardon? Bluthners and Becksteins and the uh, Steinways. Well, I, well, that's just it. But the people who, who created the pianos, designed the pianos, manufactured the pianos, you know, turned the screws, I've never seen them, but I certainly know they existed because the piano did not come about by random chance. Even if you had all the parts of a piano uh, in a box, shaking them up and down, you'll never form a piano. And it doesn't tell us where the parts came from. Mm. And so this is how you can see that creation is true, that evolution is not. Mm. It's amazing just the notes and how all those can make up a chord and the different chord sequences that exist. And we have all the different types of music. You think with all the music that is composed throughout the world over the last even 50 years, and yet, uh, they're basically this, the same eight notes. <laughs> well, but Howard, you are a musician. I, I think everybody knows Well, I'm that. a drummer. They used to call them musicians, maybe. Uh, I still consider you a musician, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I've heard you play. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, forget the instrument for just a moment. What about the human ear mm -hmm. and the design of the three tiny bones in the human ear that allow 
analog to become digital uh, inside the human brain. And how does the brain then process it into to a message which we understand? And we all and understand thing, the same message. Well, and we, we can, yeah. of yeah. course. Uh, but my point being that, that the design of the inner ear itself, uh, the balancing mechanisms, all the things that are part of the inner ear, yeah. Uh, yeah. clearly show design. And the length of the hairs that allow, again, the sound to then be transmitted from the air through the eardrum, through the bones, which Resonate. alter the... The distances and and allow then a liquid to be vibrated, which allows the little hairs to be vibrated, which turns into a, a, an electrical signal hmm. that goes to your brain. That alone would be miraculous. But how do we form <laughs> that sound in our head? Understandably, just yeah. like sight, how do we form an image in our mind when there's no screen? With the same uh, color but, reference for most people, unless they're colorblind, uh, it, it, it's just too staggering, isn't it? That it's not it, happenstance or by accident, you know. Well, that's just it. So, again, this argument by design, uh, we would have no appreciation of music uh, unless God also had an appreciation of music. He's the author of music. He's the, the infinite source of music. Um, and some translations say, you know, the joyful sound, but some translations make it uh, translated as the joyful noise. I don't know about you because... Well, if you're a drummer, it's a joyful noise. If it's yeah, Well, that's just it. If I sing, it's a joyful noise, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Okay. No, it's great. You know, it doesn't matter what we talk about as far as, um, you know, the, the sort of things that uh, sh really show that we are created in such an amazing way. And we've spoken in the past, uh, the different parts of the body, whether it's the blood system, whether it's the, the foot, the mechanism of the foot, the way the brain works. Uh, the, it's just incredible. It's just too powerfully um, constructed uh, with intelligence design uh, that it couldn't have happened by evolution. Not all, simultaneously for all of us to be uh, at this level, there's no examples of uh, people just changing midstream, as it were, in our lifetime. Well, as, uh, I would also point out one other thing about the human ear, which is that we can hear from the lowest volume to the highest volume is a one billion difference. You say that, you expound on that. From the lowest volume mm -hmm. to the, the highest volume, mm -hmm. which the human ear is capable of hearing. The amplitude. Yes, sir. We can hear a one billion difference. Um, if wow. you are very, very, if you are very, very quiet in an extremely quiet room, and you're being very, very quiet, and you listen intently, you can actually hear the blood flowing through your eardrum. My goodness, that's true. You know, yeah. But unfortunately, most of us live in a world where we can't because we're hearing everything else. Exactly. It's drowned out by the decibel differences of the normal yeah. sounds around us. I'm simply pointing out, mm. you can literally hear the blood f flow through your eardrum. Yeah. Or you can also, what I've done, stand there and listen to the launch of a Saturn V B at the Cape. <laughs> well, you can, of course, from uh, uh, Orlando. Well, we did when we were launching them. Yeah. Not anymore. But anyway, yeah, just to... Just whilst talking about sound, maybe we could help somebody to understand the complexities here that are involved and just couldn't, uh, again, have evolved that intelligently well, designed. We could, not, we could not appreciate music if we didn't first have that eardrum mm. and the entire mechanism of the inner ear and the processing equipment. Everything had to come into existence whole and complete that we would be able to do that. It could not possibly have been something less. Yes, exactly. Um, this has always been my point, really, with, with trying to understand where the uh, evolutionist uh, is thinking. You know, we'd have to have taken X amount of millions of years, or even if it was thousands of years, even if it was hundreds of years, even if it was tens of years, uh, for something to be function fully functional, what would have, would have been imbecilic? Well, the fact of the matter is, to be fully functional, it has to be fully complete. There cannot be one part missing. There cannot be one piece or step missing in the process. Everything has to be perfectly formed. It cannot come about by random chance. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of people who go to university, and they're very, you know, usually, you know, quite bright, intelligent people. Um, they learn things at the university that they can come to appreciate. Uh, others before them 
But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, with understanding and knowledge of a particular topic or subject, whether it's engineering or even science of some sort, there is uniformity. There is a consistent message, uh, an instruction to the pupil and from the pupil then into um, practical use of that information. Um, that when did we get the capability uh, of all of this um, if we evolved? You know, at what stage did we suddenly become fully cognizant of what's being taught and what's been learned? And if we go to the Genesis, we find out that, of course, music was appreciated within eight generations of Adam before the flood. Say that again. I said, if we go to Genesis, people had an appreciation of music, art, uh, and other things. They were smelting ores. They had all this technology within eight generations of Adam. Yeah. And this was before the flood. Yeah. And they always try to point to people being very ignorant uh, back then. You know, oh, they're the Stone Age, the Iron Age, etc. It's simply not true. People were, were really quite intelligent in the past. God, God pre-programmed a lot of knowledge into the brains of Adam and Eve, and they passed it on to their children uh, so that they were actually capable of doing things, which even today we wonder how they did them. Hmm. Right, moving on. Loads of questions coming in. Um, yeah, let me just try and get that um, same question. Some people are sending them in twice. Welcome back, uh, Howard and Dr. Grady. So nice to see you back on air together. My question is, Pastor John Hagee says the Antichrist is already amongst us, but has not yet revealed himself to the world so far. Do you believe that uh, he, the Antichrist, is here and operational right now? Rick in Waterford in Ireland. I know the spirit of any Christ is active at this time. There's no doubt about that. But as far as eschatology, I don't get into it. Yeah, I understand. And I quite understand your position on that. Um, but as far as we don't know everything until, you know, it's abs absolutely being confirmed and we look back with hindsight. It's easy. Um, but yes, the spirit of Antichrist, as you say, is here because we can tell that from the way the world is reacting to the gospel message. And, and one of the things the Bible does tell us is that in the end times, wh whether this is today or not, but in the end times, there's going to be a greater and greater dipolarity between good and evil. Well, certainly we do see a greater and greater dipolarity of good and evil today. And I think this is indicative of the fact that we're approaching end times, but I'm not picking a time. Uh, and the spirit of Antichrist is incredibly active in the world today. Hmm. Let me just, uh, this is rather a long one, but I'll try and read it uh, as best I can, being a dyslexic person. Um, a BBC documentary showed clips of David Attenborough in the wilds of nature, explaining the wonders of the so-called evolution. The footage showed him in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and up to the present day. Is it not an observable fact that the creatures he presents in the jungle, ocean and open plains that live as long as humans, tropical parrots and salmon, for example, basically look the same when old as when young? Is not the physical changes in Attenborough himself showing evolving <laughs> over the years in the program <laughs> evidence, not that the ravages of time, but the consequences of the arrogant pride of human sin? Very good. In which case, he unwittingly is proving creation and God's punishment and not his intended beloved sinless evolution. Very good, John. Very good. It, it, it's a very good comment in general. However, there's a flaw in that ointment. Uh, David Attenborough is a great uh, storyteller. Uh, he is convincing. He's deceiving. Uh, evolution is simply a fairy tale for adults. However, when you talked about the aging of uh, David Attenborough, I would point out to you that that is not evolution. Uh, that is simply the exact same genetic information uh, being displayed differently at different times in our lives. That as we go through the aging process, it's still the same genetic information, but it is a difference of appearance with age of the exact same genetic information. So that's not evolution. Uh, it is a natural process, a uh, different expression of the same genetic information at different times. So I would not suggest you using that 
as a as a demonstration of evolution or no evolution. Mm. Uh, but the fact second matter is thermodynamics, though. Well, we are all suffering. The aging process is a part uh, of us suffering. The second law of thermodynamics: the the absolute uh, spontaneous degeneration of all physical mm. systems. Yep. Um, I would point out that the much better argument is that all the animals, which he shows, and, and there's great photography. Oh, it's brilliant. a real love feast for, for David Attenborough. But the fact of the matter is that all those animals are whole, complete. There's no transitional forms in the fossil record or alive today. Uh, these are all unique creations of God. And that is a far better, uh, you know, interpretation of what he's showing than his fairy tales for adults. Right, Jason writes in, says, Dr. Grady refers to a new earth being 6,000 years old. I personally do not believe this, but do consider myself a Christian. My question is, is it really relevant whether someone believes in the earth is 6,000 years old or billions? I personally believe the most important thing is how we live our lives. My, my laptop just went off the air. Um, uh, and how, how we live our lives and honor God. I do not believe God cares how old we think the earth is or isn't. Well, of course, we have discussed this before in the program, and it will not keep you from going to heaven, whether you believe in an old earth or a younger earth. It's not the salvation issue. However, you said that it is only important how we live our lives, that the age of the earth or age of the universe is not relevant to God, and I would say that that's absolutely wrong. The age of the earth and universe are very relevant, and they are very relevant to the way in which we live our lives. They're very relevant to our worldview. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that if you believe in an old earth, as you apparently do, uh, you are actually decimating the power of the cross because if life and death have been going on for millions and billions of supposed years, then the death of one man on a cross is meaningless. Absolutely, yeah. You see, so what you're doing is you're negating the gospel when you believe in an old earth. Now, that won't keep you from going to heaven. You, know, you yourself can be personally a Christian. But the fact of the matter is you're negating the power of the cross. You're negating Romans chapter 5. You're negating the fact that God is omniscient. You're negating the fact that God is omniscient. You're, you're saying God is a liar, that God does not always save a remnant, that God does not always have a witness, because you are saying that the death of a nefesh organism, and that's a Hebrew word, but the death of a nefesh organism occurred because prior to human sin. The yeah. Bible very specifically states, no nefesh organism died prior to human sin. That is because of the sin of the first Adam that death came into the universe, and it is through the death of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, that death is done away. Mm -hmm. And so to accept an old earth is not a salvation issue for you personally, but to believe in an old earth has tremendous ramifications to Christianity itself. Mm, I agree. But the, there is room in the thinking, I understand, although I don't ex necessarily accept it myself, is that you, know, you could still have uh, Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago, uh, but the earth and the universe is m much older. But, but again, if that were true, then plants, animals, not people, but plants and animals, uh, would have been living and dying. And land animals are nefesh organisms. So cats, dogs, horses, dinosaurs are all nefesh organisms. They have a soul. And the Bible specifically states that no nefesh organism died prior to human sin. Romans now, 5, if, you told you if plants, If plants died, if insects died, if fish died, they are not, they are not nefesh organisms. But if land animals of a higher sort, again, cats, dogs, dinosaurs, or people, um, died prior to human sin, then that would actually break what the Bible says. And, of course, if that is true, then, again, the death of Christ on the cross is meaningless. Uh, Christianity is a joke, and we might as well all go home. Yes. I don't know whether that's a nice idea or not, <laughs> to all go home, whether it's heaven or whether it's just around the corner. But it's not a nice idea. Yeah. Well, you know, if you think about it, you wouldn't have to travel all over the world. I wouldn't have to do this program every night unless we really believed there was more to what has been said and, and on the likes of the BBC and Richard Attenborough. Well, 
Well, that's just it. We do this because it's a calling. Mm -hmm. I know I know you and I don't do it because of money. No. <laughs> you know, we, we do it because we feel that the message is real because we've experienced it. Yes. And we want to share it with others. Yeah. I wonder if David Attenborough would like to work on Revelation TV for the same fees. Uh, the answer to that I already know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, maybe you could uh, apply to the BBC. Well, do you think they'd let you in? Because David Attenborough's thinking, getting a bit old now. They, they get nervous just when I walk in the door and do a, do a radio program. That's how you got, we, I got to know you, because what happened to the BBC when you walked in the door that day? Oh, they get, they get nervous, and of course, once they have you on as a courtesy, then, then when you leave, they undercut everything that you have uh, shared, you know. Yeah. The well, BBC is very, very... 154% pro-evolution. Yeah, the BC at the end, does that stand for Big Cut? Uh, actually, of course, over here we think of it as the British Broadcasting Communism, but you probably didn't want to know that. No. Okay, moving on. Patrick writes in, he says, what is your view regarding geocentricity? Uh, I've looked into this carefully and certainly don't dismiss it. Very well supported by uh, the likes of Gerard Bow, Malcolm Bowden, I think it's very important, though, to uh, do appreciate it. It's difficult to accept at first, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. And I'm convinced it is supported scripturally by real scientific evidence and does put our Earth at the center of the universe. Would Grady be interested in this subject further? I would be happy to forward further information on this uh, subject. And that's from Patrick. Well, Patrick, I'm very well familiar with the subject. Um, First of all, I do not accept geocentricity in the sense that the Earth is not fixed and the universe does not spin around it. Uh, the sun does not rotate around the Earth. The Earth rotates around the sun. However, if you will go to my website at creationworldview.org, go to the search engine, type in Big Bang. That's just the easiest way to find the article. I, I point out that we now know scientifically that number one, the Big Bang didn't happen. Number two, redshift is quantized. Number three, our galaxy is at the center of the universe. And that's the important difference. When the Bible says that the earth is at the center of the universe, remember that the word center has different meanings. There is absolute center. But for instance, if I'm in a European city and I'm 10 blocks away from the absolute center of the city, I would still be called in the city center. And the signs of the city are there. And so uh, what we have is the Earth could not possibly be at the center of the galaxy because the radiation and gravity would kill us. This is why we're over on the side, tucked inside an outer arm of our spiral galaxy, because it's the safest place for us to be. It's in the habitable zone of our galaxy. But we now know categorically that our galaxy is at the center of the universe, it drives evolutionists nuts because they want to believe that, uh, that we do not have a special place in the universe. But the fact of the matter is we know scientifically now that we are in the center of the universe. We do have a special place and therefore it's a, somebody showing us that creation is true, that we are special. Now I would suggest you read that article in its entirety so geo and heliocentric is not the problem. The Earth does rotate around the sun. The sun rotates around the center of the galaxy. But our galaxy, out of over 100 billion that we know of, is at the center of the universe, and that is a fulfillment of what the Bible tells us. Mm, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, Darren writes in, do you believe God made the world in six days and rested on the Sabbath, uh, based on a time scale of 6,000 years for the church? and a thousand years for the millennium, as in Peter, uh, the book of, it says a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Well, that scripture has absolutely nothing to do with the age of the earth. The scripture in the New Testament that with the Lord, a day is like means similar, not equal. Every time you, every time you read the terminology is like, always substitute the word similar, it does not mean equal. And in that particular verse, it talks about God's long-suffering ability with sinful mankind, that he can suffer with us for a thousand years no more differently than I could suffer with you for a 24-hour period. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with the age of the earth. 
Now, the Earth is approximately 6,000 years old. But uh, you can 6, see why some, uh, you know, could see the, the relationship here between what I, Peter I do, is saying. I do understand that. I do understand it. And some people have a very false eschatology, I think, as well, because of that. Uh, and as we continue year after year, the false eschatology becomes more and more obvious. However, the earth is only about 6,000 years old. It was created in six literal 24-hour days. There are many scriptures to back that up. And, of course, we've got good science, as we have discussed, geochronometers, earth time clocks, universe time clocks, uh, specifically show us the science that the earth itself is only about 6,000 years old, the same of the universe. And we have discussed many of these arguments uh, before. As a matter of fact, tonight I'm going to be doing a whole presentation on them here in Atlanta. Mm. But a thousand years for a day, you, you still got some life left in it before it could be totally discounted. Well, the, the problem with that whole concept is, number one, the verses are clearly talking about God's long-suffering ability, period. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the age of the earth, no reference to the age of the earth whatsoever. Good and point. it does not say equal, it says similar or is like. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plenty of references, whether it's in Genesis, uh, one rotation of the earth, a 24 hour period, whether it's in Exodus 20, God says, I created it in six literal 24 hour days, this is why you're to work six days and rest one. Um, whether it's Jesus saying that Adam and Eve were there at the beginning, not coming along later. Uh, we have lots of those. And again, then we have the science to go with it. But the, those who want to make uh, this, this unfortunate, I think, eschatology of there's 6,000 years plus a millennial reign of 1,000 years makes the seventh day, etc. The problem with that is, of course, that we're past 6,000 years. If that were quite literally true, that we would already be in the millennium. Not, well, not according to the Jewish calendar, though, 5773 seven, or something. But the Jewish calendar is not the same thing as the age of the earth. The Jewish calendar is not the same thing, uh, trying to make it prophetic, if you would, simply because the reason for the discrepancy of the Jewish calendar of the actual age of the earth and the biblical age of the earth is that they do not count, for instance, the years that they were not in the land, such as the Babylonian captivity. Uh, so the, the fact of the matter is that there's a Jewish calendar, there's the biblical calendar, uh, we have the geochronometers, and so, you know, you, you, you cannot force that template. Mm. Uh, but within a hundred years or so, it's not far off, is it? Well, at the moment, one could make the argument it's not far off, and I understand that. And, and I would agree if we allow for some, some leeway. I'm pointing out that from a literal standpoint, though, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, bunch of liars is the heading. In the debate on equal marriage, if you are uh, regarded as the bad guys, you've only yourselves to blame. You're nothing but a bunch of bigoted liars and deluded fantasists who, for most of the time, are barely in compass mentis. The rest of us long ago put a little Yahweh into a box and 13 along with the tooth fairy, oops, it went off, <laughs> probably quite appropriately, was Thanks this uh, from our friend who writes in occasionally? What, Spawn of Satan and his boyfriend, yeah, the Proud Sodomite? One. You got it, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I won't, I won't not read them because, you know, I think yeah. we've been fair. Uh, <laughs> but along, uh, he goes, uh, we once heard this nutter McMurtry argue for half an hour that it was uh, psychologically possible for snakes to talk. Gay marriage will be law within the next few weeks. Get over it. Does that make well, it right I, if it's law? It's not in God's law. Well, first of all, man's law doesn't hold the same sway as God's law. Absolutely. And men are sinful and fallible. Yeah. And uh, I would point out again that according to the biblical account, homosexuality is a, a sin. God loves the sinner. He still loves you, the sodomite, but he still hates the sin. Now, God's original plan is revealed from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. One man, one woman, heterosexual relationship, united for a lifetime. Uh, God did not make Adam and Steve and tell them to go recruit, which is what you do. Uh, God made to, Adam and to, Eve and told them to go reproduce. Yeah, exactly, and they wouldn't be able to do that otherwise. Now, homosexuals, homosexuals, gays, lesbians, 
I, I know some people, you're going to label it as an alternative lifestyle to the heterosexual. I disagree. It is an unnatural lifestyle. Now, I'm not condemning you. I'm not throwing stones at you, etc. I'm simply saying it's unnatural. The reason being, no biological life form can be considered as natural, which cannot reproduce. And since homosexuals cannot reproduce, they require heterosexuals to do it for them. Now, there are many other things that can be said without condemning, simply to point out that homosexuality is an unnatural lifestyle. It is not an alternative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd like to just add to that. Uh, I did get an email personally from this couple saying yes. that uh, because I am um, divorced, I've had two uh, wives in my time. I'm disqualified according to scripture, which is right, I am. And the reason that uh, we refer to the scriptures is to give an opportunity to people uh, to be able to um, be acceptable, as it were, according to God's laws, uh, to enter into the kingdom of God. I myself am excluded, um, but for the benefit of yourselves, I still declare the message. But I have to add that I'm disqualified according to law, but by God's grace, um, because I've repented, I qualify. And that's the challenge to the homosexual community is that uh, you are disqualified according to scripture, but if you repent and turn around and change your lifestyle, you qualify to enter into the kingdom of God. I can't say any nicer than that. Well said, and well worth saying. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Hi guys, the new Archbishop of Canterbury is against the redefining of marriage from Michael in Braintree. Thank God for that. I'm glad to hear it, Yeah, believe me. I wonder how long he'll last. One wonders. <laughs> Uh, or oh, 10 minutes, according to my earpiece. No, that's what, how long we've got left. I'm only cracking a joke. Okay, uh, can Dr. Grady please explain what a time and times and half a time means uh, from Bob in London? If you, have you got time for that? Well... <laughs> that's, that's eschatology, isn't it? Well, it's dealing with Daniel. It's dealing with eschatology. Um, I think that I'll pass on that for the moment, although it clearly speaks perhaps of seven, but we'll... We'll let it go. Yeah, uh, there's different ways of looking at it. And, but what is quite interesting that uh, Isaac Newton dealt with that one a few hundred years ago and came up with the, the mid 21st century for the return of Christ. Basically, that's the bottom line. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. The, I, the best explanation I've heard to date on that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm only human, I'm not... Uh, uh, God, and that is that, uh, you know, the, the gentleman from Bible Oxford Church, I'm trying to remember his name, somebody tell me, Derek Walker, that's it, uh, Pastor Derek Walker, he's given the best explanation, so if you want to listen to Derek Walker, get online and find out. Hi Howard, Dr. Grady, may I just ask what happens to the spirit of some who die without the Lord? And is, it, uh, and is paedophilia any different from homosexuality in terms of the act? Um, I was called homophobic for saying there was no difference between them. I pray that God will continue to protect you both from Yvonne. Interesting question. Oh. Well, just, just to start with, pedophilia might be homosexual or it might not, depending upon the act, who's involved. But they are both equally sinful. Both well, just as paintless. our sin is. X. Uh, as far as where the soul go, or the spirit go, uh, that's very simple. Uh, those who are not saved go to hell. Those who are saved go to heaven. Paul talks about to be absent from the body is to be present from, with the Lord immediately. Um, and those that don't go to heaven go to hell immediately. Uh, there's only two options. Now, you will also find that then, uh, and, and a good reference at least, uh, in Ecclesiastes, specifically, I would say, read chapter 12. Um, but nonetheless, there are other references to that as well in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, right. This, I have to say that Dr. Grady isn't into eschatology. So um, these questions that are coming in, and the next one is along the similar lines. 
Sorry. It's best to leave those to uh, someone when we get them on uh, the Q&A show or the late show uh, who are into eschatology. And I'm saying that because Steve from Wales has written uh, another eschatological question. I'll read it because I'm here. It's like, uh, you know, mastermind, isn't it? In that sense, you've got the time to read it. When Jesus said, this generation won't pass away until he comes back, how old would that generation be? God bless you all, Steve from Wales. And, and that is a scripture that we kind of addressed earlier in the program. Yep. Uh, it is one of the scriptures which caused many uh, in the first century to think that Jesus was coming back uh, right then. Mm -hmm. but, but if you actually read that, um, and he says this generation and so forth, uh, the word generation can have a multitude of meanings again. So which nuance was he speaking about? Um, so uh, I, I would simply point out to you that Paul would, would then go on to talk about how don't worry about those who, who are dying. Uh, they will rise first at the Lord's second coming. Uh, just a comment here. Thank God we know Jesus our Lord and Savior in these days. Let's pray for Great Britain, uh, John, Tara, and uh, Ophali. Okay, yeah, amen to that. First, amen. <laughs> first time I've tuned in. Brilliant discussion. Uh, so glad you're talking about uh, the wickedness that is going on in the world today how true uh, Christians are being persecuted, which is uh, what our Lord said. It's uh, happening now, uh, the, the new world order uh, is on our doorstep. What uh, David Cameron said, we're all in this together. He was talking about the world elite, the globalists, the system of the antichrist. Satan is a genius at hiding his evil doings in plain sight. His puppets think we're stupid and blind uh, the falling away which our Lord spoke about is happening. Christianity is the one uh, they want to destroy because we know what is going on. We know the truth. This world is utterly wicked. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Kindest regards, Dave. Well, welcome to Revelation TV, Dave. Um, this is just one of the programs that we do. We do a lot of live programs uh, like the Q&A show uh, with Dr. Grady uh, McMurtry, who's um, well renowned for his stance on biblical truth particularly with regards to creation. So uh, please do stay tuned uh, for future programs. So we ought be back have tomorrow night too. Yeah, like tomorrow to night as well. Yeah, uh, amen. Uh, why do you think there is no mention of Joseph, uh, Mary's husband, towards the end of the gospel, says Michael? Because he was a man who died, and not every person who died is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and he died you know. quite early on as well in Jesus' life. Well, well, we know that we know that Mary and Joseph had many other children. Uh, we, we know the half-brothers, half-sisters. We, we know names like James, who was a half-brother. Uh, we know at least the names of four half-sisters. Uh, so, you know, they, they, God allowed them to have a family simply because Mary was the chosen one to be the vessel by which Jesus would be born. God did not prevent them from having normal family life together. But it does appear that Joseph was probably significantly older than Mary, uh, certainly did not live as long as Mary, but certainly was a very good man. Mm. And, uh, and they both worshipped God. Uh, he was the, the male role figure for Jesus growing up, so to speak. Um, but the fact of the matter of when he died exactly was not particularly relevant to the gospel. Uh, neither, neither is Mary's death specifically recorded, although we know that she went with John to, to Asia Minor, uh, to Ephesus, but um, we don't know the exact year she died. Mm -hmm. Yes, interesting. So Joseph must have passed away before uh, Jesus' death because he gives uh, over his mother to John. Yeah. Right. Well, that's just it. Uh, jo Joseph is obviously dead before the crucifixion. There, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. But, but over that some 30-odd period, 30-year period between the birth of Christ and, the, and his official ministry and crucifixion, uh, he is obviously gone out of the picture. But he did have other children with Mary. Yeah. Hi, guys. Always watch the show and love it. My question is, uh, why can Saul not recognize David after he slays Goliath? Because he asks who the young lad is. Even when he is in front of Saul, he seems to know him. When the previous page, as we know, he hangs his armor on him. 
Would, I'd really like to know the answer. God bless you. Angelo from London, please could you tell me why? So why, what's your understanding of why Saul uh, really hated David? Well, actually, I think it was a rhetorical question. Um, Saul r really was having a problem with David. And remember that when you read the Bible, you don't read the intonation. You, you don't read the way in which it was actually said. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, who is, it? who is this lad? You know, who's this upstart? Yeah. You know. Could well, be even his own brothers had a problem with him. Come on, right? Well, right. yeah, I would agree with that too. Um, but what about uh, other cases in which we could ha have a similar situation uh, of this rhetorical kind of question? Um, you know, Pilate says what is truth, but it was a, the question that every human being had on their lips every day in mm. that time frame. It wasn't something special. Mm. Can I go back to uh, this because we've only got two minutes left, and, and it's something which I, something really spoke to my heart when I read uh, this account over and over again. What I get from it is he was the youngest of all the brothers, David, uh, his own brothers, even when he brings the lunch to the battlefield, who he wasn't involved with the army, he wasn't deemed to be man enough to deal with the army or be involved in the army. Here is David says, well, you lot seem to be so scared of this giant. Uh, excuse me, in the name of the Lord, I will go forward and slays him. Uh, there's a jealousy not only be amongst his own brothers and his own family, uh, against David, but then Saul becomes so jealous because David wins, slays by the thousands, and uh, Saul only by the hundreds, if you get what I mean. So Saul becomes envious too. And do you know what I get from this, Dr. Grady, is there are people who look at you as a ministry and see you and scoff at you because you've come from nothing. And yet God raises up people who would seem in the natural to be the last person one would choose. And we're at the end of the program. The music's already playing in the background. That's great. We look forward to having you tomorrow night. Thank you, sir. Look forward to it Yeah, and thank you. I hope that helps uh, Angelo uh, for writing in. God bless you, and we'll speak to you tomorrow by God's grace. Amen.